Ah, hot tea. Ah, good morning, gamers. Welcome to Getsy on Goosebumps, the only show in which you get to watch me read and review every single Goosebumps book from R.L. Stein's original series. And today, just in time for Halloween 2019, we've got Goosebumps number 48, Attack of the Jack-O-Lanterns. Uh, classic Jacobus art here. I like that he's done different expressions for all um, the, the jack-o'-lanterns there. Um, just a nice little touch that, uh, that makes the Jacobus artwork uh, really pop. Um, tagline is, put one head in front of the other. And the blurb reads as follows. Pumpkin power. Nothing beats Halloween. It's Drew Brockman's favorite holiday. And this year will be awesome, much better than last year, or the year Lee and Tabby played that joke. A nasty, practical joke on Drew and her best friend Walker. Yes, this year Drew and Walker have a plan. A plan for revenge. It involves two scary pumpkin heads. But something's gone wrong. Way wrong. Because the pumpkin heads are a little too scary, a little too real. With strange, hissing voices and flames shooting out of their faces. So this is one of several Goosebumps books um, in which revenge plays a motivating factor. You see, Drew and Walker are pissed off. Um, two years ago, these really cool and popular kids, uh, Lee and Tabby, held this part Halloween party at uh, one of their houses, and then these two people broke in and started like making them do push-ups. In a surely traumatic experience, they're wearing like masks and not letting them leave or like call the police or anything. It was like a stage home invasion. But actually, it was just a prank from some older kids who were friends with them. Like, Lee and Tabby were in it the whole time. Really nasty joke. And the year after, they planned to get them back at their own Halloween party, but uh, Lee and Tabby bail at the last moment. So it's two years of unrequited revenge. And this year, they've got the perfect plan. Um, Drew and Walker and uh, their two friends, Shane and Shana. We don't actually hear what the plan is. They plot it, they plot it for a long time, but we never actually... It's slow like in movies where they go... Oh, I've got the perfect idea, and they all hold it and go, whoosh, whoosh, and then we see it play out. And that's what we're seeing. So on Halloween night, Lee and Tabby agree to go trick-or-treating with the four of them. And, uh, you know, Drew and Walker are a bit, bit sort of wary, like, where's, where's Shane and Shana? So these two figures start joining them with these jack-o'-lanterns on their heads and, like, fire inside the jack-o'-lanterns. And Lee and Tabby are like, oh, you thought that would scare us. That's obviously Shane and Shana. Like, oh, nice try. You thought you could get back us like that? Um... But um, Drew and Walker are a bit like, is that, is that really Shane and Shana? Like, you know, the fire inside the heads is real and they've got these weird, like, hissing voices. Anyway, they go trick-or-treating, get a lot of candy, but the, these two pumpkins, these two jack-o'-lanterns keep making them go for more and more candy. They keep urging them to keep going to candy. Keep going to candy? To keep getting more and more candy and more trick-or-treating to the point that they're dragging their bags across. I'm like, we can't, we can't do it anymore. And the jack o are like, you know, eat your candy now so you've got more room and sort of like this, uh, you know, uh, kind of visceral um, forced eating scene where all these the, these four kids are like on the ground like shoveling candy in their mouth because these jack-o'-lanterns like made them do it and they feel really sick afterwards. And then they lead them to this, this neighbourhood they've never seen before where everyone at the door has a jack-o'-lantern for the head and it's, it's, it's creepy and it's freaky and, you know, they keep asking to go home, but they're like, no, we've got to keep trick-or-treating forever and ever. And eventually they get surrounded by all, like, the people with jack-o'-lanterns, the jack-o'-lantern people from the neighborhood, like, surround them. And the, everyone's freaking out. And then they bring these four pumpkins and, like, these are your heads now. These are going to be your heads. And Lee and Tabby just shit themselves and, like, run away screaming into the night. Ha ha ha, says Drew and Walker. Shane and Shana, your plan worked perfectly. And yeah, sure enough, it was actually Shane and Shana all along. But how do they manage to have such a costume? Well, it turns out they're aliens from another planet, and Drew and Walker are aware of this. Like, oh well, you know, it helps to have friends from another planet. Um, apparently, that the aliens took over that whole entire neighborhood. That's why they all had pumpkins for heads, and they can shape shift. I don't know why they had to wait two years before they remembered. Why don't we use the fact that our two best friends are shape shifting aliens to get back at these school bullies? Ha ha ha. Yeah, but I don't know, you know, it's sort of, it might seem like a lame twist, it sort of makes sense in the, in the context of the story, like there has to be a reason their costumes can be so effective, and it's, you know, it's a classic, uh, 
Stein-esque twist in that, you know, they're not actually, you know, disembodied pumpkins talking. They're actually just two kids. Oh, but hang on, those two kids are actually aliens. It's sort of like a, a you know, a, a, a double bluff, if you will. Also, one thing I forgot to mention, uh, their dad at the start doesn't want them to go out trick-or-treating because um, some fat people have been going missing in the neighborhood. Yes, they mention their weight. Um, and at the end, uh, Jewel Walker like, hey, you don't eat candy, what do you eat? And like, ha ha. <laughs> and then it's implied they were abducting the fat people to eat them. Oh well. I like that it's set across one Halloween evening. It's similar to the, the Goosebumps, the, it's similar to the Haunted Mask books in that respect. As I said, the ending may seem cheesy. I'm okay with it. It kind of makes sense. You know, as much as aliens posing as pumpkins can make sense. Drew and Walker do know it's Shane and Shana the whole time, but the way they're communicating with the reader, you know, if you read it back, you'd go, wait, why are you acting so scared? Why are you like, you know it's them the whole time. And it does that because it needs the reader to not know if they're Shane or Shane or not. But that's just a, that's just a literary critique. That is not, not warranted in a book called Attack of the Jack-O-Lanterns. The scariest part is probably when they're forced to eat all that candy and to, to keep trick-or-treating. It's just such a weird horror device to be forced to eat candy on Halloween, but it, yeah, it definitely works. Overall, a good Goosebumps book that I, the resident expert, on Goosebumps would recommend. But that's all for this week. Please join me next time in which I discuss Goosebumps number 49, uh, Vampire Breath. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you for watching and please stay spooky.